Hello, and welcome to this episode of UK Paranormal Files. Today, we shall take a look at the Crogling Grange Vampire Legend. This story is sourced back to the memoirs of prolific author Augustus Hare, entitled The Story of My Life, which was published in 1894. We know quite a bit about this man through various sources, including his own published accounts. Mr Hare is described by author Rosemary Ellen Geely as a stalwart clergyman of good repute who lived in a rectory in Devonshire. Geely, in chapter 5 of her book, Vampires Among Us, revised edition, paints a picture of the character of the man and how Hare had at least one encounter with a ghost, which he dealt with in a most straightforward and no-nonsense manner. Shortly after being installed at his rectory, he entered the study one day to find an old woman seated in an armchair by the fire. The woman appeared real, but Hare knew that was impossible. There was no such woman in or near the rectory. He shrugged, chalked it up to indigestion, sat down on her in the chair, and she promptly vanished. The next day, he encountered her again in a passage and boldly rushed up against her. Again, she vanished. After a third encounter, Hare had to find out who this woman was. He wrote to his sister and asked her to check with two local spinsters who were the sisters of the clergyman who had preceded him at the rectory. Upon hearing of Hare's encounter, the spinsters were distressed. The ghost was their mother, they said, and she had appeared frequently to them during their stay at the rectory. They had hoped that, upon their departure, the old lady would be at rest. Apparently, this was not the case. It is Hare who gives us the account of the Crogling Grange vampire, and cites it as being recorded in the same form as it was told to him by a man named Captain Fisher. What follows is the story of the Crogling Grange vampire, in as close to his own words as I am able to render. Fisher may sound like a very plebeian name, but this family is of ancient lineage, and for many hundreds of years they have possessed a very curious place in Cumberland, which bears the weird name of Crogling Grange. The great characteristic of the house is that never at any point of its very long existence has it been more than one story high, but it has a terrace from which large grounds sweep away towards the church in the hollow, and a fine distant view. When in lapse of years the Fishers outgrew Crogling Grange in family and fortune, they were wise enough not to destroy the long-standing characteristic of the place by adding another story to the house, but they went away to the south to reside at Falcombe, near Guildford, and they let out Crogling Grange. They were extremely fortunate in their tenants, two brothers and a sister. They heard their praises from all quarters. To their poorer neighbours, they were all that is most kind and beneficent, and their neighbours of a higher class spoke of them as a most welcome addition to their little society of the neighbourhood. On their parts, the tenants were greatly delighted at their new residence. The arrangement of the house, which would have been a trial to many, was not so for them. In every respect, Crogling Grange was exactly suited to them. The winter was spent most happily by the new inmates of Crogling Grange, who all shared in the little social pleasures of the district and made themselves very popular. In the summer, there was one hot day which was dreadfully, annihilatingly hot. The brothers lay under the trees with their books, for it was too hot for any active occupation. The sister sat in the veranda and worked, or tried to work, for in the intense sultriness of that summer day, work was next to impossible. They dined early, and after dinner they sat out in the veranda, enjoying the cool air which came with the evening and they watched the sunset and the moon rise over the belt of trees which separated the grounds from the churchyard, seeing it mount the heavens till the whole lawn was bathed in a silver light, across which the long shadows from the shrubbery fell, as if embossed. So vivid and distinct were they. When they separated for the night, all retiring to their rooms, the sister felt that the heat was still so great that she could not sleep, and having fastened her window, she did not close the shutters. 
in that very quiet place it was not necessary, and, propped up against the pillows, she still watched the wonderful, the marvellous beauty of that summer night. Gradually, she became aware of two lights which flickered in and out in the belt of the trees which separated the lawn from the churchyard, and as her gaze became fixed upon them, she saw them emerge, fixed in a dark substance, a definite, ghastly something, which seemed every moment to become nearer, increasing in size and substance as it approached. Every now and then it was lost for a moment in the long shadows which stretched across the lawn from the trees, and then it emerged larger than ever, and still coming on and on. As she watched it, the most uncontrollable horror seized her. She longed to get away, but the door was close to the window, and the door was locked on the inside. And were she to unlock it, she must for one instant be nearer to it. She longed to scream but her voice seemed paralysed, her tongue glued to the roof of her mouth. Suddenly, she could never explain why afterwards, the terrible object seemed to turn to one side, seemed to be going round the house, not to be coming to her at all, and immediately she jumped out of bed and rushed to the door, but as she was unlocking it, she heard a scratch upon the window and saw a hideous brown face with flaming eyes glaring at her. She rushed back to bed, but the creature continued to scratch, scratch, scratch upon the window. She felt a sort of mental comforting knowing the window was securely fastened on the inside. Suddenly, the scratching sound ceased, then a kind of pecking sound took its place. Then, in her agony, she became aware that the creature was unpicking the lead which held the window in its place. The noise continued, and a diamond pane of glass fell into the room. The long, bony finger of the creature came in and turned the handle of the window, and the window opened, and the creature came in, and it came across the room, and her terror was so great that she could not scream, and it came up to the bed, and it twisted its bony fingers into her hair and it dragged her head over to the side of the bed and it bit her violently in the throat. As it bit her, her voice was released and she screamed with all her might and main. <coughs> her brothers rushed out of their rooms, but the door was locked from the inside. A moment was lost where they got a poker and broke it open. The creature had escaped through the window and the sister, bleeding violently from a wound in the throat, was lying unconsciously over the side of the bed. One brother pursued the creature, which fled before him through the moonlight with gigantic strides, and eventually seemed to disappear over the wall into the churchyard. Then he rejoined his brother by his sister's bedside. She was dreadfully hurt, and her wound a very definite one, but she was of a strong disposition, not given either to romance or superstition. And when she came to herself, she said, what has happened is most extraordinary, and I am very much hurt. It seems inexplicable, but of course there is an explanation. It will turn out that a lunatic has escaped from some asylum and found his way here. The wound healed, but the doctor who was sent for her would not believe she could bear so terrible a shock so easily, and insisted that she must have a change, mental and physical. So her brothers took her to Switzerland. Being a sensible girl, when she went abroad she threw herself at once into the interests of the country she was in. She dried plants, she made sketches, she went up mountains, and as autumn came on she was the person who urged that they should return to Crogling Grange. We have taken it, she said, for seven years, and we have only been there one, and we shall always find it difficult to let a house which is only one storey high, so we had better return there. Lunatics do not escape every day. As she had urged it, her brothers wished nothing better, and the family returned to Cumberland. From there being no upstairs in the house, it was impossible to make any great change to their arrangements. The sister occupied the same room, but it is unnecessary to say she always closed her shutters, which, however, as in many old houses, 
always left one top pane of the window uncovered. The brothers moved and occupied a room together, exactly opposite that of their sister, and they always kept loaded pistols in their room. The winter passed most peacefully and happily. In the following March, the sister was suddenly awakened by a sound she remembered only too well. Scratch, scratch, scratch upon the window. And looking up, she saw, climbed to the topmost pane of the window, the same hideous brown, shriveled face, with glaring eyes looking in at her. This time, she screamed as loud as she could. Her brothers rushed out of their room with pistols and out the front door. The creature was already scudding away across the lawn. One of the brothers fired and hit it in the leg. But still with the other leg it continued to make way. Scrambled over the wall into the churchyard and seemed to disappear into a vault which belonged to a family long extinct. The next day the brothers summoned all of the tenants of Crockling Grange and in their presence the vault was opened. A horrible scene revealed itself. The vault was full of coffins. They had been broken open and their contents, horribly mangled and distorted, were scattered over the floor. One coffin alone remained intact. Of that the lid had been lifted but still lay loose upon the coffin. They raised it and there, brown, withered, shriveled, mummified but quite entire, was the same hideous figure which had looked in at the window of Crobling Grange with the marks of a recent pistol shot in the leg and they did the only thing that can lay a vampire. They burnt it. And there, end of the story. In 1924, Charles G. Harper, who was unconvinced of the story, set about uncovering if there was any truth to it. His research concluded there was no such estate as Crogling Grange, but there was Croglin Low Hall and Croglin High Hall. Croglin Low Hall was originally a single story building but was extended after the 17th century and a bricked up wall is supposed to be the position of the original window through which the vampire penetrated the grange. No churchyard was adjacent but a church was about one mile away but this contained no tomb or vault which matched the story. However, in the 1930s, Harper's findings were challenged by F. Clive Ross. He too visited Cumberland and interviewed local people. He also concluded that Croglin Low Hall was Croglin Grange from the story, but also claimed that foundation stones for an adjacent chapel do exist. Ross spoke with a witness named Mrs. Parkin, who claimed to know descendants of Captain Fisher. She claimed the captain was born in the 1860s, and had heard the vampire story from his grandparents. Mrs. Parkin also suggested that the deeds to Croglin Low Hall indicate that until 1720 it went by the name Croglin Grange. According to Hare's account, the story takes place in 1875 to 1876. The evidence apparently contradicts this. It is still unclear if the well reputed author took creative license in moving his story to a more modern era or if the captain failed, misled, or embellished in his accounts. The purpose of such a change or omission is, of course, entirely speculative. It is time for me to offer my summary and conclusions. I have been researching a number of vampire accounts for the UK Paranormal Files channel recently, and there are two observations about this story that have struck me. Firstly, there seems to be a general consistency of the accounts which have prevailed over time, the manner and characteristic of the supposed vampire. In that regard, the Crogling Grange story fits the mould. In these stories, there is no romanticism of the creature's intent. It is a twisted, abhorrent being, unquestionably of unnatural origins. Graveyards and coffins are its consistent habitat, often unkept or in disarray. Temporary hypnotic paralysis is a consistent feature too. Secondly, and somewhat obviously to state, there are parallels to the classic characteristics we take from vampire literature, and that of course of the defining work of Bram Stoker. 
the obvious initial conclusion when considering vampire tales in the modern era is to conclude, through whatever means, that the established works of fiction on the matter lend, in some measure, to each local myth. However, given this supposed era, either as stated or earlier, it seems that stories such as this one have lent to the literature. Stoker, in particular, is noted as having engaged in extensive research on vampire cases and law for Dracula, and published his defining work in 1897, whereas Hare's account was published four years earlier. It may well have been one part of the source material that Stoker considered. But there is much more source material for both Stoker and potentially Augustus Hare or Captain Fisher, should the Crogling Grange vampire be of concocted stock. In 1871, a different and popular genre-defining novella, Camilla, was published, and yet this was still some 52 years after John William Polidori's Vampire was published in New Monthly Magazine in 1819. Sensational publications which became known as Penny Dreadfuls also featured tales of vampires within the macabre mix of sensational characters and monsters in the Victorian age. Published via multiple editions of a serial between 1845 and 1847, Barney the Vampire is one such example, and its namesake character is described as entering his victim's rooms by the window, has hypnotic powers, superhuman strength, and he would leave puncture marks in the necks of sleeping maidens after drinking their blood, piercing their skin with his fangs. It seems to me Augustus Hare was a man of good standing, who seems to have simply recanted a story, sensational and macabre as was fitting the era. We know less about Captain Fisher, but those who have taken the time to investigate it have prodded a few holes in the account, which leaves us stretching to make the legend fit all that remains. On the UK Paranormal Files credibility meter, I'm classifying the legend of the Crogland Grange Vampire as an entertaining story. Please let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with this rating, and if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button for the channel. Don't forget to click the bell icon to receive notifications. Here on the UK Paranormal Files channel, episodes do take a lot of work and research, so there is unlikely to be a set routine for when episodes come out. The best way to get notified is to subscribe and click the notification button. Thanks very much for watching.